Hey, what's up? It's uh, Mr. Bill here today. And today, I'm going to show you how I like build my racks uh, that I can play live when I'm doing my live sets these days. So basically, when I play live these days, I have this drum pad here. Um, it's kind of hard to see. It's a Roland SPDSX. Um, it has nine pads, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. My mic's in the way, so that's it. You can kind of see it when I move my microphone. Um, <clears throat> and basically, what, what I do with my sets these days is I build like these large arrangements um, in separate project files and I call these project files chunks and then after I finish like producing a chunk um, I render the stems out of that chunk which is made from many stems from other tracks that I've written and then I put them all into a, what I call a master session and in this master session we have all the chunks with all the tempo arrangement and the tempo clips and I actually have done a tutorial already about these tempo clips and I think I've basically I've done a lot of tutorials or talks rather about um how I play live. I did one at Slam Academy in Minneapolis and I did one for DJ Tech Tools. So I'll like link both of those in, in the description or um, make an annotation just like here or something. Uh, and, and you can go check those out. <clears throat> but what I'm specifically wanting to talk to you about today is these racks that I make and how I do it. So as you can see here in this set, um, I'm sort of building this uh, set for the fall tour and here's all the fall tour dates that I'm doing. I'll also link those in the description. Uh, and you can see that throughout the set, I've kind of just got bits turning on and off and, and I play the parts and there's like little notation here to say play certain things. So if I'm, you know, at this section of the set um, and it's like play the colloidal chord bass, um, you know, when it gets to that part, I just play that bass. So I was like... So that's basically just playing back these samples. And and that's sort of the idea behind the whole set is that um like things from these stems are just muting and, and turning on and off and stuff and and as they're muting I'm just sort of like playing the parts and, and the parts have been cut out of these stems basically and then thrown into this rack and then this rack has this pitch knob in uh sorry, this pitch MIDI plugin in front of it. And as that automates it like selects to play different parts of the rack basically so when this pitch is down at zero it's going to obviously play things from uh, from the bottom of the rack which you can see here and as I turn the pitch knob up you can see that it starts to play stuff higher in the rack so I turn it up one octave uh, and you can see it's triggering cells that are higher in the rack now Oops. Um, so basically that, that is what that, all this automation is for is just to, to select what rack is playing at what given time. So how do I make the rack? Um, well, basically what I'm, what I'm doing here, uh, I've, I've already filled up this rack pretty much and I've already filled up this rack. So now I need to create another rack and I'm going to call this one, uh, let's call this main rack three, I guess. And I'll, uh, potentially even make separate, uh, instrument racks that turn on and off or maybe just like have separate MIDI channels or something for each different chunk because I'm doing that much these days in like each separate chunk that I'm um, that I kind of almost require like specific instrument racks uh, so you know maybe I'll just call this chunk one and then I'll have like a whole separate instrument rack on a whole separate channel um, for like a different chunk and then throughout the set I just have to like turn on different MIDI channels or, or something like um yeah something like that anyway so what I do is I I put the drum rack in a chain like this and then I have a chain selector that eventually uh, so th so these two here um, they're sort of temporary things that happen just just forget about those I'll, I'll make these like black but essentially if you're just wondering what they are um, it's for this section over here uh, no sorry not here where is it here uh, what happens is eventually some other racks start turning on and creating like layered gongs and music boxes and stuff like and then as it gets to this point, there's like full music boxes and gongs. And if it plays, it so that's kind of what, what that stuff's for. Um, so just, just forget about that. So anyway, um, yeah, what, what I'm going to do... Now that I have a, a drum rack in here, uh, I need to set my chain selector to select that particular rack, right? So let's say when we get to this section of the set, um, well, actually there's something after it that, so this needs to go back to whatever it was at, which is one. 
Okay. Yep, that's good. So now, uh, when we hit this part of the set, you can see that this chain selector that I just automated has gone to correlate to main rack three. And now we can start filling up this rack with samples um, and the pitch plugin would need to be automated back to zero just for this section, uh, just so we can you know, have the correct uh, correlation of pads to the drum rack happening at that given time. So I'll just drag this down until it says zero uh, semitones. In fact, it might be easier if I just do it this way. Where are we at? Nine, it's pretty close. Uh, down a little bit further, zero, here we go. So now that we've automated that down to zero, you can see that when I play this rack, it's triggering these uh, these nine samples just here, um, all these cells just here, which are basically correlating to the nine pads on my drum rack. Um, so one thing that I need to do as well is tell it a 16th note before uh, we get to that change, it needs to change. And this is just to sort of uh, facilitate uh, any late latency in the sound card, uh, sorry, in the, I guess it's the sound card because um, I set my latency or my, my buffer size rather it's, um, to facilitate any buffer size errors and also to facilitate the fact that I might play the note a little early so if I just uh, shift the change a 16th note early which would also mean that I would have to shift this uh, chain selector change a tiny bit early as well then that way I'll always just hit it at the correct time so <clears throat> now we have to find out um, we, we need to find out now how many actual uh, hits are in this piece of audio that I want to play. So this is what I want to play on the rack. So that's what I want to play. And I want it to behave in a way where I can kind of just, you know, hit them and, and it plays those notes. So it's like... Etc, etc. Um, <clears throat> the problem with this piece of audio here is it has some noise on it. So if you listen to this, you can hear it's got that at the start of it. And that's just to kind of make the drop sound a bit heavier. So in fact, uh, I'll probably uh, completely remove this one. And what I did is I uh, put a, I rendered a version out of the original Fuchsia project file because the lead is from a track of mine called Fuchsia. And I rendered it just dry with no effects on it at all. So. Uh, how does that sound? Sounds like this. Oops. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, so I'm just going to use that piece of audio to cut to the rack because I don't want to have any noise and stuff happening. So now we just need to kind of figure out exactly how many hits are in it. So I'm just going to cut this up evenly wherever there's like a new note. So there's there. There. So some of these are actually like sort of doubled notes, if you know what I mean. Like um, some of them are, are the same note twice that happens in the sequence. So obviously we'll go through after we cut them all and, and figure out what is redundant and what's not. make this eighths. Ah, oh, no, it has to be sixteenths. And we should cut these a little shorter. Cool, so that's the amount of uh, notes that I that I have in there. And if we uh, select this whole thing and you, and you look just down here where I'm clicking this button that turns the clips on and off, you can see, it, see that it says 53 clips. So it's quite a lot. Um, we we want to try and get that down, that number down as low as possible so that we can take up as little amount of cells in the drum rack as possible for multiple reasons. 
Um, the less drum racks you have in a set, probably the less CPU you're going to use, which is super important because if you're trying to play stuff live and you're trying to run your buffer size on 64 samples, then you obviously don't want to be using that much CPU, right? So um, we're trying to keep the CPU usage down as low as possible. And we're also trying to keep the amount of, um, <coughs> it doesn't matter how many clips there, like the, it, it's not going to create more audio by having more clips because all of these clips are actually just referenced by the same uh, chunk of audio or, or rather the same chunk of audio references all of these clips or however you want to say that. So that doesn't matter. Uh, but there's also going to be less programming as well because every single time that we move past a set of nine cells, uh, we have to automate uh, the pitch plugin to kind of move along with that. So uh, say over here, for instance, you can see that I've got a lot of uh, pitch plugin automation. And basically, if, if I play through this and you look at the rack that it correlates to, which is this rack here, you'll kind of see that we're just going through the cells um, with this automation, right? And that's because uh, there was like some filter automation going on on the uh, synth that I wanted to play. So I had to automate this pitch plugin to kind of work its way through that. So it sounds like this. So you can see now that we've moved up into this second range here, it's now playing these samples here. And then if we move on to the next bit, it plays you can hear that the filter is like opening up and, the, and actually a filter is not opening up. What's happening is that it's just playing different samples where the filter has been opened up on the sample. Yeah, and then eventually it sounds like that. <laughs> So that's the way I kind of um, emulate like filter movement and stuff in, in the set. I could have just like, you know, um, rendered out like the most open part of the sound and then just had a filter automate over it. And I do do that sometimes. That's why I have a filter on the other side of this rack. But in that particular case, it just didn't really work. And that's why I didn't do it. Okay, so now we need to figure out what here is, is actually um, a duplicated note and what's not. So these two are duplicated notes and I would always preference the longer one because it has the tail on it. And if we just set up the choking uh, in the in the samples, uh, sorry, in the drum rack, if we just set up the choking to be, let's see, uh, you can see all my choking here is just set up to be one. That just means only allow one sample to play at a time, basically. So <laughs> for this particular rack with, um, with all of these uh, chains in them, so all these uh, separate channels here are called chains. And every single time that I play one sample and then I play another sample, it chokes it and it says, no, you can only have one playing at a time sort of thing. So that's why I do that. So that's arguably a redundant note. And we could just go back. Or another thing that we could do, if I wanted to make it super easy for myself, is I could just fill the rack up with samples like this. And then I could just like hit the same pad over and over again and just have this pitch plot and automate. Um, and, and you know, it kind of, I guess, makes it look more exciting to the crowd and it kind of is just fun to sit there hitting a pad live, you know, rather than just sort of playing tracks or something like that. I find it much more amusing personally to play, uh, just to play pads live and stuff like that. So let's say hypothetically we did choose to go that route. We would basically just automate this to be one semitone higher. Uh, like this. there maybe yeah that's pretty good um so that's just an example and then we would probably have to set all of these to happen just like a 30 second note before just to just to um counter the fact that i probably play it a little early and stuff like that so now if we just start on this pad here and we just hit that as it's playing it should just play the melody <laughs> So that's the idea. You can set it up in any way you like. I could set it up so I could just have it, you know, like this and then play the pad like. And then just have it sort of automate every now and then rather than automate every single time. And I haven't really decided exactly how I want to play this section yet, but that's kind of half of the battle is like figuring out how you want it to correlate to the pads. 
and how you actually want to be playing it live. Uh, another thing to note is that what you can do is you can go into your user library here and you can go into presets, instruments, drum rack, I think it's in there or maybe it's in defaults. Here we go, defaults, uh, dropping samples on a drum rack. So you can see that I have these defaults in here and basically what happens normally is when you drop a sample in, it will say that the volume of the sample should be negative 12 and the velocity should be like 45 or something like that. So what you do is you just change everything to what you want then you just drag it into this defaults folder here and then from now on anytime you drag a sample into a drum rack it will like default to zero with like no velocity and stuff like that. So that's basically how I've been building the racks in my set. Uh, if you want to come and see me play this set uh, you can do so at any of these dates and I'll also put the link in the description <coughs> and um, yeah hopefully you enjoyed the video and if you learn anything from it awesome if you didn't then that sucks I'm sorry to have wasted 15 minutes of your time but yeah cheers have a good day